Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. It is my prayer that the content that you're about to enjoy adds value to your life. If you like it, please let us know by hitting that like button. Also, we'd love to connect with you, so please leave a comment below letting us know your thoughts. If you know someone who will enjoy this content, make sure to share it with them. For more content like this, subscribe to our channel and hit the notifications bell so that you never miss when we post something new. Don't forget to check out the video description for links to more information and other resources. May God bless you. This morning we continue our series in the life of Joseph. We're in Genesis chapter 41. And judging by the time, I'm going to be going fairly quickly here. But I do have a blog and there's lots of notes. I found some interesting things about Egyptian culture and regarding the dreams and other things. So please check out the blog. I put a lot of time into it. And then it's also free to share with a friend. And later on, I add the audio from this morning. So um, in case somebody missed it and you want them to have this message, you can share with them. It's not up yet because I don't want you reading ahead, but it should be going up in a few minutes uh, before I finish this morning. There is a passage that I really like in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Now, I like a lot of them, but I really like this one. Jesus spoke these words. It says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give who what? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So with that in mind, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we understand that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So, Father, we ask that you please be with us as we read the Bible. May your Holy Spirit guide us in this study, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 41. I hope you have your Bibles open. It's always good to hold the preacher accountable. Don't just believe what I say. Always make sure it's right there in the Bible. That way, when you go home and you talk with friends, it's not my pastor said, it's I read the Bible and I learned. So I want you to learn from the Word of God and hopefully I can serve as a guide to you this morning. The chapter 41 of Genesis begins with the following words. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Before we get to the dream, two years have gone by. Last time... I preached, last time we were here, we talked, that, that I preached, we talked about Genesis chapter 40, where Joseph is stuck where? In prison. And then, we don't know how long he's been in prison, but the, the chief baker and the butler, or the, the cupbearer, they're thrown into prison as well, and they both have a dream. Joseph interprets their dream, and he says to the cupbearer, please remember me when you're restored to Pharaoh. Give him, put in a good word for me, and he forgot. And how long... How much time has passed? Two years. Imagine thinking, this is it. This is when I get out of prison. This is my chance. God has given me this opportunity. And then two years go by. Do you still have faith at the end of two years? Being wrongfully accused. Stuck in a difficult situation for two years, do you still have faith? Or by the end of that time period, have you just walked away from God altogether because life was just too difficult? Because God didn't hear you fast enough? Because what's the point of worshiping God if life is going to be this hard? We pick up the story, and two years have gone by, and this time, Pharaoh has had a dream. And it's interesting, this dream that the Pharaoh has, and I invite you to read it along with me. You don't have to read it out loud. I'll read. You can follow along. Verse 2 says, Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly cows ate up the seven fine-looking fat cows. And Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up in one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it was a dream. 
Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of, the, of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told him his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Now I, I imagine this in my mind. You know, reading and Pharaoh calls for the magicians. The magicians show up and Pharaoh's like, okay, I had this dream. Can you guys help me with this? And they're like, ah, that's a weird dream. But I can pull a rabbit out of this hat. <laughs> Do you feel better? You know, like, I, I wonder why would he call magicians? So I, I did some digging and, and I found out that the magicians were common in the court of foreign kings. The Egyptian term is, it translates roughly to chief lector priest who also practiced the magical arts. The training center for the crafts was the house of life where guidebooks for dream interpretations were produced. These dream books are known from the 12th dynasty which involved the interpretation of dreams by discerning puns and symbolic images. And maybe you remember this because when we read about Moses, much later on in the book of Exodus, remember that he comes by and, and then, you know, he does certain miracles and the magicians can imitate those? Well, these are the same magicians. These are, you know, put together with the wise men. These are the people who know the secret arts. And Pharaoh calls all of them together and none of them can interpret the dream. While I was studying this, I also noticed something interesting. I didn't catch this on my own. Uh, uh, one of the comment, uh, Bible commentaries pointed this out. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 8, it's interesting, the grammatical structure, because when Pharaoh is asking the, for the interpretation of his dreams, it says, and Pharaoh told them his dream singular, but they could not interpret them plural. So there's a theory that the Pharaoh was insisting these two dreams are one dream. And the magicians were saying, no, two different dreams, two different interpretations. And he's saying, no, it's just one. So this could be part of why nobody could interpret. It's not that they were clueless. It's that they couldn't all agree on what it really was. So just keep this in the back of your mind. Some Bible translations are faithful with the singular and plural. A lot of them just make both plural because there are, you know, two parts to this dream. But it's a minor detail, but I think it plays in to this story. And as we read on to verse 9, it says, The chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my what? I remember my faults this day. Now, this line made me think if perhaps it was out of convenience that he forgot to tell Pharaoh about Joseph. Because it would be very difficult to have a conversation with Pharaoh about the school guy he met in prison without mentioning the fact that he spent some time where? In prison. And why bring that up and run the risk of Pharaoh remembering why he sent you to prison? Does that make sense? I mean, he was restored. You don't want to start asking for favors, right, when you come back to, the, to your position, right? And then as time went by, do I really want to bring up the past? You know, ah, Joseph will be fine in prison. I mean, it wasn't that bad, right? And he just kind of forgot. But now, this is once again my interpretation as I think about this, he could win favor with Pharaoh by solving this problem that nobody seems to be able to solve. So maybe it's worth the risk. And he says, well, you know, I remember that time that I, I made you upset. We can laugh about it now, right? Ha, <laughs> ha, I remember. Yeah, so you sent me to prison. And while I was there, there was this guy. And the baker and I, we, we had dreams. And, and there was this Hebrew man and young man. And he was there. And you know what, Pharaoh? He interpreted both of our dreams. And things happened exactly the way that he said. Well, when Pharaoh hears about this, he sends for Joseph. He calls him out of the dungeon. Verse 14 of Genesis 41 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. The idea here in the original is that there was running involved, and, and they also had him shaved and changed his clothing, and he came to Pharaoh. Now, shaved here is not just his beard shaved. Chances are it was his whole head as well, according to Egyptian custom. So he shows up looking very much Egyptian, and Pharaoh speaks to him. Verse 15, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, 
But I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. Now, place yourself in Joseph's shoes. This is a good opportunity to negotiate, right? There is a demand for a specific service that only Joseph can provide. Maybe if you were in his situation, if I was in his situation, I'd be very tempted to say, you know, Pharaoh, for the right price, I could let you know the meaning of your dream. You know how interesting, Pharaoh, that nobody else in Egypt could tell you this. You know, I could tell you what it means. What, what, am I, what do I stand to gain from this, right? There's that human nature that says, God has given me this gift. How much money can I make off of it, right? God has equipped me in this situation. He wants me to take advantage of Pharaoh. I mean, after all, he left me in prison. Now, you know, you can always reason for a way to why it's okay for you to take advantage of the Pharaoh at this point. You know, he's the government. He's, you know, there's all kinds of issues going on here. I was in prison. I heard all about it. But instead, Joseph says words that I find really surprising. He says, me? I, I can't interpret your dream. Joseph, what are you doing? This is your chance. Build yourself up. What you, 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 you don't say those things. You tell him, yes, you can. You make up something if you have to. You don't put yourself down. But Joseph does. He's very clear. He takes this opportunity. And instead of building himself up, Verse 16 says, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He takes an opportunity that he could have used to build himself up and he says, it's not about me. It's about God. And this tells me that two years forgotten in prison, I mean two that we know of, we don't know how long he was there before that, his faith is still strong. He still loves the Lord after going through all of that. And that's incredible. And at this opportunity, he points Pharaoh to the one true God. Now, it's really interesting here that Pharaoh goes into the dream. And I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. But when you read it, Pharaoh is a lot more dramatic when he explained his dream than, the, interpret than the, the version of the dream we read right at the beginning of chapter 41. There's a little bit, there's a few more adjectives added because you can see there's an emotional response that Pharaoh has to this dream. And at verse 24, when he finishes retelling the dream, he says, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. And I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain this to me. Now Joseph will give him the interpretation. And it says, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. In my mind, Pharaoh turns to his magician and says, see, I told you, I told you it was one dream. But anyway, that's just me. Then he says, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. I love how Joseph is careful with his words. He's building up Pharaoh. He says, look, God is talking to you. He's revealing to you what he's about to do. Now, of course, this is useless unless Joseph is there to interpret but God is speaking to Pharaoh he makes this very clear to Pharaoh and he says the seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads of grain are seven years the dreams are one and the seven thin heads and the ugly cows which came up after are seven years and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do God has this habit of revealing to his people what he's about to do. Here he reveals to Pharaoh and uses one of his children to, to interpret it. Indeed, verse 29, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of, of Egypt, and famine will deplete the land. So the plenty would not be known in the land because of the famine following it. It will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now Joseph doesn't just stop there. His, he was hired in a sense, right? He was called there. He was summoned to interpret the dream. And he did. But in his boldness, he went one step further and also gave a solution. And we pick this up with verse 33. 
Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, let him and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of produce of the land of Egypt in seven in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep the food in the cities. Then the food shall be a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. That last phrase there, I think it's important. I have it underlined in my Bible. It shows where Joseph's heart is. He doesn't want to keep this information or withhold it and exchange it for power and influence and wealth. He wants people to be well. He doesn't want anybody to die, to suffer from the famine. He says, I have this special knowledge from God. I want to share it with you. Please put this into practice so that the people will not suffer. Can you imagine if those who love God approached non-believers with that mentality? As opposed to, do this, or life will be miserable and God's going to punish you. What if we said, man, I learned some great things, and it can help alleviate your suffering. Let me share what God has shared with me. Let me share some of the things that I have learned about God. And this is what Joseph is doing. He's not asking for money. He's, not, he's just saying, hey, here's an idea. If you put this into practice, fewer people will suffer. And I think that's a great understanding of the gospel. Here's this thing that God is doing. And if you put this into practice, fewer people will suffer. That's his concern. That's what Joseph cares about. But I don't know if you paid attention to his recommendation. I was thinking about this. And, oh, I, had, I was one slide behind. I'm sorry. Did Joseph just invent taxes? I was thinking about that and it bothered me. I did some research. Turns out, Egypt is the first nation that we have record of having taxes, but they seem to predate Joseph, at least according to what, you know, scholars have discovered. So what used to happen in Egypt, and I have quotes on this on my blog, is that Pharaoh would go around and collect a tax, usually of cattle, and he would distribute this among his officers. What Joseph is calling for is a little different. It's a tax on grain, and he's storing it for the people. So as opposed to just making Pharaoh and his court wealthy, he says, no, nobody's going to touch this until the end. Now, the good news about this is that everybody who was there, like if word gets out of what Joseph is doing and the dreams and the vision and what God is about to do, everybody's able to plan for this. Everybody who believes in the God of Joseph and believes in his interpretation can prepare because it's, I mean, they're going to be building these things to hold all the grain. Everybody can have their own extra storage and prepare if they only believe in prophecy. And I'm going to go on a quick side note here, and I promise to come back and finish the sermon within a short period of time. There is something special about God's relationship with prophecy. I believe he says the God, the Bible, apart from any other religion in the world. And I've had this conversation with people from different world religions, and it's not, you know, a, a popular stance to take that my religion happens to be the right one. Oh, how can you know? There's a little bit of truth in all religions. And I don't deny that. There's some wise men and women who came up with some very wise sayings in different world religions. However, when you look at prophecy the way it is in the Bible, I have yet to find it in any other religious book when it comes to the character of God represented in the Bible when he says something is going to happen and then it does happen I think it sets it apart it's I'm not saying that everything else is there's no value in it I am saying it would be foolish to put all the magicians on the same level with Joseph does that make sense I'm sure that they had something to contribute. I'm sure that they knew some things. I'm sure that they had some good ideas. I'm not saying it's completely useless. I'm just saying to the level of what God is communicating here, they didn't even come close. What I'm saying is what the Bible has to teach is on a different scale from any other religious book. I'm not saying that any other religion doesn't have anything good about it. I'm just saying it's apples and oranges. 
And I am open to have a conversation about this. If you're watching online and, you know, leave a comment, I'll try to reply. If you read it on my blog, let's, have, let's sit down and let's talk. I believe prophecy is one of the things that sets the Bible aside from everything else. It's the reason why when we have evangelism as Adventists, usually we begin with Daniel and the, the image of the statue. And I'm open. If any other religious book has prophecy that is exact to that degree, I'm open to this conversation. I think this is an opportunity for Pharaoh to realize all of these other religions, all these other gods, they're really of no use if this is the one God who can foretell the future so that we can prepare accordingly and he's the one in control. But he won't learn his lesson because, you know, culture and just the way I've always done things and changing just because this one God says something. It's, it's tough. The next, oh, about 400 years later, another Pharaoh will witness the power of God and his superiority to all of their gods. And he'll still hold on to his own thing. So conversion is not so much an information thing. There has to be more to it. But I hope that all of us can appreciate the God of the Bible being on a different level than any other God. The Bible being on a different level than any other religious book. With all the respect for all the other world religions and the wonderful people that follow in those ways, I still believe they could all benefit from learning more about the God of the Bible. Does that make sense? In a loving way, I want to share because I feel what this book has to teach, it adds value to all of our lives. Not putting anybody down, I'm just lifting up the Bible. And I myself am still learning. I am still growing and I learn from other people. And there are amazing things happening in the world, but I still believe that the God of the Bible is just on a different level compared to anything else this world has to offer. And especially when you look at Jesus on the cross, there's something about Jesus. But my friends, let's, let's continue with the story. The, the way that Pharaoh replies to this, verse 37, it says, The advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is what? Is who? The Spirit of God. And I put a type on that. Their spirit should be capital S. I believe the spirit is a person, a part of the Godhead, the Trinity. Joseph's special abilities, his success, even in the midst of difficulties, it's all due to the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. Verse 39 we continue, it says, then Pharaoh took Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all there is, uh, all this, there is no one as discerning as you as wise as, and as wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people and, be and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt and then there's there is more that goes into it for the sake of time I'm just gonna skip for now but you can go home and read it once again Joseph is set in charge of everything we saw it happen in Potiphar's house we saw it happen in prison now we see it happen in all of Egypt now I have a personal theory that I love to share with you and we have time a few minutes so so listen and let me know if you agree with me or not this is a conversation starter what if what if God took Joseph and put him in Potiphar's house for however many years? We don't know how long he was there. But what if the idea was for Joseph to learn not only the language, the customs, but also to learn how to run a house effectively? Right? He was managing a few things and more and more, and he could run a house efficiently, and everything was prospering. Good. You learn the culture. You learn how to run a household. Now, here's the next step. I need you to learn about how things happen at the court. How can Joseph learn about what's happening at the court? God sends him to prison. Not any prison. The prison where Pharaoh would send the people that got in trouble, right? The, the political prison, I guess. So as Joseph is there, I imagine this in my mind. People are being sent to prison and they're talking. Whether they're there for a little bit, whether they had the death sentence, they're talking. Joseph's finding out. Okay, so there's this guy in court. I have, I have to watch out for that guy. 
oh, this thing. Oh, okay, the Pharaoh feels particular about this. Oh, definitely don't do this thing. I, I, I imagine in my mind he's learning about the, the politics of Egypt and how things get maneuvered. So once he's ready, God gives Pharaoh the dream. Because that way, it was not Joseph rescuing himself by telling the cupbearer what to do. That didn't work out. He spent two more years. When Joseph gets out, it's not because of his own skill and wisdom. It's because God gave Pharaoh a dream. God brought him out at the right time. Meanwhile, he was in training. He was in preparation. Because now when he steps into power, he's able to remain in power. Because first of all, he can advise people how to run a house. So he can, you know, he's familiar. But not only that, he knows who to watch out for in court. So he can have longevity while he's in power. In my mind, God was preparing him. Because remember, he was 17 when his brother sold him. And then we're going to, we find out as you read on, that he is 30 when he's established into power. That's a long journey. I hope that we don't give up in that in-between period. Right when God is preparing you, for where he's taking you next, for you to just walk away from him and say, it's too hard. It didn't happen fast enough. I didn't sign up for this. When you look at the cross and you see Jesus dying for your sins, can you have any doubt about God's love for you? And if God loves you and he's a mighty, powerful God, can you trust him to take you where he's taking you? And it might be a while. And there are other people who get in the way, and they can be really mean. And this story of Joseph just challenges me to be faithful to God all the way through, trusting in him to work through and to provide. And not only that, I'd like to close with a reference back to Luke eleven thirteen. 13. The only way that Joseph is able to remain faithful and kind and efficient and always rise to the top wherever situation he finds himself in is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his heart. Amen. And that's not something that's limited to Joseph. And that's not something that was limited to Pentecost in the New Testament. That's something that's available to all of us. And God himself said, I want to give it to you just have to ask. You know, a lot of times we're asking God for the success. Right? Lord, make me second in command. Make me first in command. Lord, give me a promotion. And really, what I think from reading the story of Joseph, we should be praying, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. Because Pharaoh looked at Joseph and said, the Spirit of God is in you. I want you in power. Do you see how that happened? What came first? The Spirit. By the way, in my Sabbath school class, we're talking about the story of David and Saul. You know what Saul had? He had an army. He had the budget. He had official power over all of Israel. You know what David had? The spirit. You know what Saul didn't have? The spirit. But how often in our lives, we're chasing the crown, we're chasing the gold, we're chasing the power, when really we should be chasing the spirit. Because with that, everything else comes. So once again, read this with me. You can read it out loud. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If you'd like to ask for the Holy Spirit, I invite you to stand as we close with prayer. I hope you were blessed by today's message. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you or for you, please feel free to contact us. May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.